Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… People keep reporting sightings of a giant, five-foot-long worm lurking in the Gobi Desert. Witnesses say it's armed with spikes, it spits venom, and if you get too close, it can even take you down with an electric shock. It's known as the Mongolian Death Worm. If you've not heard of it, it's because no one to date has yet been able to photograph it. So does that mean it doesn't exist? Or is it just too fast to capture on film? Mount Pentilicus near Athens, Greece is where the marble was cut to build the Parthenon. But more recently, it has a more sinister reputation – for being haunted, particularly around a certain cave known as Davilus Cave. Do you have people in your life that you can't stand? A co-worker, perhaps? Or a family member? Or a grumpy neighbor? You might call them toxic, but there was a lady who was so noxious that people couldn't literally stand her. Her name was Gloria Ramirez. But first, for six years, Fritz Harmon used his position as a police informant to hide in plain sight while he carried out at least 24 grisly murders as the Vampire of Hanover. He was also called by some the Butcher of Hanover. But neither nickname given to him by the public comes remotely close to describing how evil the man truly was, or how gruesome his crimes actually were. We begin with that story. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. In the 1920s, Fritz Harman was known as a successful seller of second-hand clothes and was beloved by housewives for his endless supply of cheap meat. Until they learned, he harvested both of his products from slain, runaway boys. The people of his native Hanover all thought Fritz was something of an oddball, but friendly and certainly harmless. Even the police liked him, and he worked for them as an informant while he carried out a horrifying killing spree right under their noses. Once his crimes were discovered, Harmon became notorious as the Vampire of Hanover, who killed his victims with a love bite that went right through the windpipe. Also called the Butcher of Hanover, he ultimately confessed to nearly 30 murders, but police suspected he killed dozens more. Born in 1879 to a morose father known as Sulky Ollie, he was doted on by his invalid mother. The youngest of six, he loved playing with dolls, wearing dresses, and avoiding other children, especially boys. In an effort to force his son to toughen up, Ollie packed young Fritz off to military school in the southern German city of Briesack at the age of 16. Although the boy enjoyed his time there, after just a few months at school, he discovered that he had epilepsy. Dismissed from the school due to his condition, he worked in his father's cigar factory for a year before committing his first crime – sexually molesting young boys. Captured and charged by the police, he was consigned to a mental asylum. After just six months in the asylum, he escaped and crossed the border to Switzerland. 
While in Switzerland, he became engaged to a young woman named Erna Lowert. However, the short-lived engagement fizzled when she got pregnant and he returned to Germany in 1900 to complete his compulsory military service. Due to his epilepsy and probable mental illness, Harmon was hospitalized for four months in 1901 and dismissed from the military in 1902. After his discharge, his father made repeated attempts to have him thrown back in the asylum permanently, but Fritz managed to evade him every time. After leaving the military, Harmon first got by on his pension, which increased in 1904 when he was finally classified as disabled. Over the next decade, he supplemented his pension with petty crimes, burglaries, and cons. Unfortunately for the teenage boys of Hanover, Harmon's crimes would escalate dramatically following the end of World War I. By 1913, the police were fed up with his repeated crimes and threw the book at Harmon. Convicted of burglaring a Hanover warehouse, he was tossed in jail for five years, allowing him to sit out World War I. In jail, Harmon met 24-year-old pimp Hans Granz, with whom he fell quickly in love. Upon their release, they took up residence together. Paroled in 1918, as the German Empire was crashing spectacularly, he immediately took up two jobs. One was with a gang of smugglers. The other was as an informant for the Hanover Police, a position that would play a huge role in his next project. In September 1918, 17-year-old Friedel Rowe ran away from his home, disappearing into the back streets of Hanover. When Rowe's father set out to find his son, he learned that young Friedel had been friendly with Harmon, who often took young boys over to his apartment for a bit of fun. Yet when Rowe's father brought this clue to authorities, police were reluctant to interfere with their most valued spy. He persisted in his requests and eventually they agreed to visit Harmon. There they found Harmon in bed with a 13-year-old boy, but no sign of Friedel. All they could do under the laws of the time was arrest Harmon for indecency with a minor. Harmon later pointed out that the police couldn't have searched too thoroughly. Friedel Rowe's severed head had been tucked away behind the stove the whole time they were there. Harmon was already well known as a black market butcher, popular among most people of the area for his friendliness and his irresistibly affordable meat. By 1919, Germany was in dire economic straits and many families struggled to keep food on the table. Throughout the early 1920s, Harmon spent much of his time loitering around Hanover's train station, scouting for teenage boys to coax home with promises of food and comfort. Thousands of children were running away from home at this time due to post-war hardships, so he had plenty of victims to choose from. After feeding his victims, Harmon would kill them by biting through their windpipes in what he grotesquely called his love bite before sexually molesting their dead bodies. Finally, he would dismember them, grinding their flesh into sausage meat or chopping them into cutlets to be sold as beef or pork. After butchering his victims, he dumped their remains into the nearby River Lina. For six years, while the police turned a blind eye to their favorite informant's activities, Harmon is believed to have murdered over 50 boys, often chosen by Grands out of jealousy of some item of clothing of theirs. He became successful selling their clothes and their flesh, even as more and more parents descended on the city stalked by the Vampire of Hanover, desperate to find their vanished children. In May of 1924, the police were forced to turn their attention to Harmon when children discovered a skull on the banks of the Lina. After several more skulls and skeletons were found, the River Lina was dragged, uncovering the bodies of at least 22 teenage boys or young men. The city of Hanover panicked, and suspicions turned to Harmon thanks to his reputation for bringing runaway boys to his apartment. Due to his status as a favorite informant, the Hanover police were deemed unfit to investigate him. So two detectives from Berlin arrived on the scene to take over the investigation. 
The Berlin detectives soon found Harmon in a dark corner of the train station, attacking a teenager. He was thrown in jail while they went to search his apartment, much more thoroughly this time. Inside was a nightmarish scene. The walls and floor were stained all over with blood, and more than a hundred pieces of victims' clothing were found. In custody, the vampire of Hanover was only too happy to confess to his crimes. When asked how many he'd killed, he casually replied, 30 or 40, I don't know. Later, he said he probably killed between 50 and 70 boys. However, police were only able to identify 27 of his victims from 1923 to 1924 alone and were unable to find the dozens of others. Harmon was charged with multiple counts of murder, and a trial date was quickly set. In court, Harmon smoked cigars and insulted everyone present. Once, looking at a photo of one missing boy, he shouted at the boy's grieving father that he could never have had anything to do with the child as he was far too ugly. Found guilty of 24 of the 27 murders he was charged with, Harmon was swiftly sentenced to be decapitated by guillotine on April 15, 1925. His lover, Granz, who had often emotionally blackmailed Harmon into murdering particular children, was sentenced to life in prison, but the sentence would later be commuted to just 12 years. After his death, Fritz Harmon's head was preserved in formaldehyde and given to the medical school in Gotenen. In 1925, the remains of his victims discovered in the River Lina were buried in a mass grave in Stokner Cemetery. Though the people of Hanover were eager to get past Harmon's horrifying murders, his crimes inspired the German expressionist filmmaker Fritz Lang's classic 1931 thriller M. In M, both the police and criminals in a large German city hunt for a serial killer who preys on young children. Harmon and Hans Grand's grisly crimes had one other tragic effect, though. Although homosexuality was illegal in Germany at the time, it had been largely tolerated for some years. With the lurid stories of Harmon's sexual violence and Grand's sickening cruelty, a wave of homophobia swept through the country. As the hearts of most Germans hardened towards the plight of gay men, the path was cleared for the later campaign of murder against homosexuals carried out by the Nazis. Hans Granz, however, survived to a ripe old age, dying in Hanover in 1975. Decades later, in 2015, the medical school in Gotenen tired of storing Harmon's preserved head and cremated it, thus doing away with the last traces of the Butcher of Hanover. I've often joked about how instead of an energy drink, I need a motivation drink. They just don't exist, or so I thought. I was told recently about Magic Mind. They wanted me to consider promoting their product, but I never endorse anything unless I've tried it and approve of it first. After taking Magic Mind with my morning routine every day, along with my vitamins and my coffee as always, in less than a week, I was feeling more focused, more alert, and surprisingly, more motivated. I'm spending more time on what's important and getting more accomplished when doing so. My mood is better, making each day less stressful. Magic Mind is doctors validated. It has over 200 scientific studies behind each of the ingredients, like cognizine cytosoline, it's the best nootropics on the market, the highest possible grade matcha, organically grown mushrooms from California, and more. Magic Mind uses nano-encapsulation technology. It helps your body to absorb the good stuff that much faster and more efficiently. So, I gave them my stamp of approval. I even signed up for a monthly subscription of 30 bottles before telling them I approved. And now Magic Mind is giving you, my weirdo family, a special deal. Up to 48% off your first subscription or 20% off a one-time purchase with the code DARKNESS at checkout. Go to magicmind.com darkness 
and then use the code DARKNESS at checkout. According to sightings, the Mongolian deathworm is a long, sausage-like sandworm, dark red in color, with spikes jutting out of both ends of its shapeless body. Using venomous spit strong enough to corrode metal or electric shocks powerful enough to kill an adult human, these alleged deadly worms are said to live below the sands of the Gobi Desert. Legends circulate freely about these monstrous worms, but no one has ever come forward with proof of seeing them firsthand. This is the true story behind the rumored Mongolian deathworm. The Mongolian deathworm is an infamous creature whose legend lives in second-hand accounts that have been passed down for generations. Mongolia's nomadic tribes call it Algoi Korkoi which translates roughly to intestine worm due to its alleged resemblance to the inside of a cow. The worm-like creature with blood-red skin is said to reach up to five feet in length. But it's nothing like your average worm. The Mongolian deathworm is believed to possess some distinctly terrifying features. A British biologist, Carl Schuker, noted of the legendary creature in his book the Unexplained, An Illustrated Guide to the World's Natural and Paranormal Mysteries, which I will link to in the show notes, the Mongolian deathworm is believed to possess spike-like projections at both ends of its body. It is also said to have formidable ways of attacking humans or other animals. The worm can purportedly spit corrosive venom or shoot out a powerful shock, electrocuting its victim. Legend has it these terrifying creatures spend most of their time hidden underneath the sandy dunes of the Gobi Desert, but that they often surface during the wetter months of June and July. If a local should happen upon this creature, they know to steer clear. The Mongolian deathworm, for all the stories of its deadly projectile and grisly appearance, has to this day never been photographed, but not due to lack of effort. Curious researchers and intrepid adventurers have combed the Gobi Desert in search of the legendary creature. Most famously, Czech cryptozoologist Ivan Makerly, one of the foremost investigators of the mysterious animal, traveled to Mongolia three times in search of the worm, in 1990, 1992, and 2004. Makerly first heard of the death worm as a boy from the work of paleontologist Ivan Yefremov. In college, after meeting a Mongolian student who believed in the worm, he became obsessed. He combed through Mongolian literature to find more clues about the death worm and was finally granted permission by the government to conduct research there when he was in his late 40s. Inspired by Frank Herbert's 1965 sci-fi novel Dune, which features giant sandworms that are attracted to rhythmic vibrations, Mackerley's expedition team tried different ways to project vibrations underground during their search for the Mongolian deathworm. One of the team's contraptions was a motor-generated thumping machine. But alas, their efforts proved fruitless, and Mackerley concluded that the creature must be a myth. While Mackerley's expeditions failed to discover sound proof of the animal, they did provide most of the modern research material related to the Mongolian deathworm. Subsequent expeditions to hunt down the sand beast continue today. Although the legend of the Mongolian deathworm remains strong among locals, its existence has yet to be corroborated by physical evidence or research. Zoologist Roy Chapman Andrews was the first Western researcher to take note of the legend. He learned about the elusive sand creature from Mongolian officials before his pioneering expedition to document Mongolian wildlife. In his 1926 resulting book, On the Trail of Ancient Man, which I'll link to in the show notes, Andrews wrote, Then the premier asked that, if it were possible, I should capture for the Mongolian government a specimen of the Alagorhai Horhai. None of those present ever had seen the creature, 
but they all firmly believed in its existence and described it minutely. The Premier said that although he had never seen it himself, he knew a man who had and had lived to tell the tale. Then a cabinet minister stated that the cousin of his late wife's sister had also seen it. However, this anecdote about the Mongolian deathworm is merely a footnote in Andrew's book. Scientists dismiss cryptids like the chupacabra and the yeti as urban legends due to lack of scientific evidence. But there is a possibility that such a creature like the Mongolian deathworm might exist. After all, even Jane Goodall, one of the foremost primate experts in the world, said she was open to the possibility of Bigfoot. The Gobi Desert is a vast region that spans a territory of 500,000 square miles of rough terrain, making the existence of an undiscovered animal species very likely. Additionally, there are worm species that have been known to live in sand instead of soil, like the giant beach worm in Australia. Moreover, in worms, the circulatory system functions by absorbing oxygen through their skin and carrying it through their body which would allow them to grow up to large sizes, like the deathworm's purported five-foot length. Yet nobody has been able to capture photographic proof of the Mongolian deathworm. So how did the legend come to be? There are a few explanations that could be at play. The first theory is that these accounts might actually be true. But like most stories passed orally for generations, they have become greatly exaggerated. The English translation of Deathworm from its original Mongolian name is also misleading, and experts believe that if such a creature exists, it may be a type of reptile, not a soft, wriggly worm. Either the worm lizard, which looks like a large, limbless worm that burrows underground and grows up to several feet, or a type of sand boa snake could have originally inspired the Deathworm lore. No matter how the legend of the death worm began, cryptid researchers have not given up hope that someday they will unearth it. Mount Pentelicus, a mountain near Athens, Greece, has been an important area for thousands of years. It is the location of the ancient quarry from which marble was cut to build the Parthenon and other great structures in the city of Athens during its Golden Age. Marble, however, is not all there is to the mountain. The mountain also has many mysteries, mostly surrounding a certain cave which has gained the nickname Davilus Cave. Davilus Cave, or Penteli Cave as it is more commonly called, is a cave historically hidden by pine forests. At the back of the 60 meters or 197 foot long and 20 meters or 66 foot high cave is a network of tunnels, one of which leads to an underground pond. Another tunnel, according to one tradition, leads to hell. Although the cave does not look too mysterious from the outside, The cave has been the location of many strange events, such as sightings of shadowy, ghost-like apparitions, UFOs, and other paranormal entities. The cave has been considered an otherworldly place since antiquity. In ancient times, it was a sacred site to the nature god Pan and his nymphs, a place known as Panapalion. Artifacts have been found in the cave depicting the god, Niches have been cut into the walls, and there is an alcove with a pool of water for some unknown purpose. After the arrival of Christianity, it continued to be a place of spiritual significance and was used as a hideout by Christian hermits and solitary Eremitic monks. According to some accounts, the church at the entrance to the cave was built in the 11th century. It was built as two connected chapels, Within one of the chapels are some unusual glyphs which have been attributed to Anchorite monks. The unusual design of the church has led to speculation that the church was actually built very early in Christian history by Gnostics or another offshoot of Christianity. 
During the 19th century, the cave also gained notoriety. It was said to be used as a base by Davilus, an infamous outlaw who was known for stealing from the wealthy. It's also claimed that he had an affair with a French noblewoman who happened to live nearby during that time. It is this association that earned the cave the nickname Davilus Cave. The cave has always been the site of strange phenomena. In the 19th century, people claimed to hear mysterious voices coming from the corridors of the cave. Some people would also hear music that didn't appear to have a source. The strangeness of the cave was also reinforced by its environment, being located on an isolated mountain slope surrounded by a potentially ominous pine forest. In the 1960s and 1970s, paranormal investigators gained an interest in the cave and began looking into it. By the mid-20th century, with the dawn of the space age, UFO sightings have also been added to the strange stories associated with the cave. One of the main investigators was a man named George Balanos. The investigation continued for years without progress. These investigations were hindered by malfunctions in technological devices, such as cameras and flashlights, as well as peculiar behavior on the part of the investigators. The story of Pintelli Cave got even stranger when in 1977, a group of workers and technicians claiming to be from an unknown organization put up barbed wire around the cave and began to do work on the cave with dynamite and bulldozers. When people tried to go into the cave, they would be turned away by guards posted by the organization. Popular theories of their identity included NATO, the U.S. government, and the Greek military. Many people speculated that they were building some sort of nuclear bunker or nuclear weapons storage facility. Wilder theories included the opening of extra-dimensional portals and manipulation of a magnetic channel connecting the cave to Langley, West Virginia, USA. What is also strange about the work done by the mysterious organization is that, after a while, they stopped reinforcing restricted access to the cave and holes were cut through barbed wire. During this period, there were also a lot of weird stories of events surrounding the cave. In one account, a couple going on a hike discovered a car perched on a ledge near the cave in a location which seemed impossible for a car to reach. They came back again multiple times over several days and the car was still there. Finally, they went up to the car and found that, oddly, the car did not have any marks of damage expected of a car driven to that position. When the wife looked into some bushes around the car, she started screaming hysterically. When the husband calmed her down, she said that she'd seen a white, oval-shaped creature that was about 60 centimeters or 24 inches long with two enormous glowing eyes. The husband did not see the creature, but he did see the bushes rustle as if an animal had just moved through them. Days later, the husband also saw something that appeared to be a spinning black sphere outside his car window, which caused him to start screaming and shaking until his wife was able to calm him down and coax him into explaining what he saw. Suddenly, in 1983, the work crews disappeared almost as mysteriously as they had arrived. They, however, did not leave without a trace, even leaving behind some of their equipment that had just been abandoned. The ancient church and natural cave networks had been severely damaged. Additionally, several artificial concrete corridors had been dug, though some appeared to be only half completed. Whatever the objective was of this organization, it's unclear that they reached it. There was another attempt to continue modifications in 1990, but it was immediately shut down by the Greek Ministry of Culture to prevent further damage to the important historical and archaeological sites in the cave. Current explanations for the unusual phenomena in the cave include magnetic channels and disturbances in the local electromagnetic fields. After decades of searching, investigators seem no closer to finding the answer than they were in the 1960s. One discernible pattern, however, is constant references to electromagnetic disturbances. The work done by the shadowy organization in the 1970s 
may have been done out of interest in these electromagnetic disturbances. It has been suggested by neuroscientists such as Michael Persinger of Laurentian University that pulsed electromagnetic fields can influence perception, causing people to feel as if there is an invisible presence in a room. It has also been noted by scientists that places that are claimed to be haunted tend to also be places of unusual electromagnetic activity. It is also interesting in light of this that technology such as cameras and flashlights tend to malfunction in the cave, which also can happen as a result of certain kinds of electromagnetic interference. Could there be an actual connection between local electromagnetic fields, technology malfunctions, the interest of shadowy organizations in the cave, and the alleged paranormal activity taking place? It may be a while before an answer is found, but the connection to electromagnetic fields at least provides a clue for solving the riddle of Pentelli Cave. Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. On the evening of February 19th, 1994, Gloria Ramirez, 31-year-old mother of two, was wheeled into the emergency department of Riverside General Hospital in Riverside, California. Ramirez, a patient with terminal cervical cancer, was complaining of irregular heartbeat and difficulty breathing. En route to the hospital, Ramirez was administered oxygen and given intravenous fluids. By the time she entered the ER, she was barely conscious. Her speech was sluggish her breathing shallow, and her heartbeat rapid. The medical staff injected her with a cocktail of fast-acting drugs to alleviate her symptoms, such as sedatives and agents to calm her heartbeat. When those failed to produce any change, the staff tried to defibrillate her heart with electricity. At this point, several people saw an oily sheen covering Ramirez's body, and some noticed a fruity, garlic-like odor that they thought was coming from her mouth. A nurse named Susan Kane pushed a needle into the patient's arm to draw blood when she noted an ammonia-like odor. Kane handed the syringe to Maureen Welch, a respiratory therapist, so that she could take a closer whiff of the dying woman. Welch sniffed the syringe in her hand. It smelled of ammonia. Welch then passed the syringe to Julie Gorjinski, a medical resident who also noticed the unmistakable smell of ammonia. Orchinsky also observed unusual manila-colored particles floating in the blood. At this point, Kane collapsed and had to be carried out of the ER. Moments later, Orchinsky complained of nausea and she too slumped to the floor. Maureen Welch was the third to pass out. That night, 23 people fell ill, of which five had to be hospitalized with various symptoms. Orchinsky was in the worst shape her body convulsed and she breathed intermittently. She also suffered from hepatitis, pancreatitis, and avascular necrosis in her knees, a condition in which bone tissue dies off. Orchinsky was on crutches for months. Gloria Ramirez died within 45 minutes of her arrival at the hospital. The official cause of her death was given as kidney failure due to metastasized cancer. Ramirez's death and the effect of her presence on the ER staff is one of the most baffling medical mysteries in recent history. The source of the toxic fumes was undoubtedly Ramirez, 
but autopsy reports were inconclusive. The possibility of the emergency room harboring noxious chemicals and pathogens was also ruled out by a careful search by a hazmat team. In the end, the health department declared that the hospital staff most likely experienced an outbreak of mass hysteria, perhaps triggered by an odor. The report angered many staff members who were on duty that night. The conclusion of the health department, they felt, was an insult to their professionalism. Eventually, the Federal Research Facility in Livermore was asked to take a look at Ramirez's autopsy and toxicology reports. Forensic analysis had found a lot of peculiar chemicals in Ramirez's blood, but none was toxic enough to produce symptoms as experienced by the emergency room workers. There was a lot of different drugs in her system, such as lidocaine, Tylenol, codeine, and Tigan. Ramirez was a cancer patient and was understandably under a lot of pain. Many of these drugs were painkillers. Locating the source of the ammonia-like smell observed in the emergency room was easy. Scientists found an ammonia compound in Ramirez's blood that had most likely formed when Ramirez's body broke down the anti-nausea drug Tigan that she was taking. The most peculiar chemical found in her blood was dimethyl sulfone, a sulfur compound that occurs naturally in some plants, is present in small amounts in many foods and beverages, and is also sometimes produced naturally in our bodies from amino acids. But in Ramirez's blood and tissues, there was a hefty concentration of dimethyl sulfone. Forensic analysts figured that the dimethyl sulfone had come from dimethyl sulfoxide, or DMSO which Ramirez must have used as pain relief. DMSO came into existence in the early 1960s as a wonder drug and became very popular among athletics for treating muscular strains until the FDA found that prolonged exposure to the drug caused eye damage. Use of the drug was restricted except in certain formulation, but DMSO continued to gather an underground following as a home remedy it's likely that Ramirez had applied DMSO to her body to ease her pain. The DMSO was absorbed by her skin and entered into her bloodstream. When paramedics and later the emergency room workers gave her oxygen, the dimethyl sulfoxide was oxidized to dimethyl sulfone. It was this dimethyl sulfone that crystallized into manila-colored crystals inside the syringe when Susan Kane drew blood at the hospital. Now, dimethyl sulfone is relatively harmless, except for one thing. If you add another oxygen atom to the molecule, you get dimethyl sulfate, a truly nasty chemical. Vapors of dimethyl sulfate instantly kill cells in exposed tissues. When absorbed into the body, dimethyl sulfate causes convulsions, delirium, paralysis, coma, and even damage to the kidneys, liver, and heart. In severe cases, dimethyl sulfate can also kill people. What caused the dimethyl sulfone in Ramirez's body to convert to dimethyl sulfate is up for debate. The Livermore scientists believe that the conversion was caused by the chilled air temperature of the emergency room, but this theory is unsubstantiated. Organic chemists scoff at the idea since direct conversion of dimethyl sulfone to dimethyl sulfate had never been observed. Others believe that the symptoms shown by the hospital staff don't match the symptoms of dimethyl sulfate poisoning. Furthermore, many of the known effects of dimethyl sulfate usually take several hours to show, and yet the fainting spells and other symptoms at the hospital began to occur minutes after the supposed exposure. Others still doubt that significant quantities of the suspected chemicals could have been produced from the DMSO. Several years later, the New Times LA proposed an alternative explanation. The hospital staff was illegally manufacturing the drug methamphetamine and was smuggling them in IV bags, one of which was inadvertently hooked up to Ramirez. The exposure to methamphetamine may have caused the rounds of nausea, headache, and blackouts. The idea of a secret meth lab in a major hospital not only sounds extraordinarily stupid, it probably is. The basis for such a wild theory is that Riverside County has been one of the country's largest distribution points for meth. The DMSO theory is still the best forensic experts could come up with, 
But it still doesn't explain everything, and its major caveat is that the lack of established mechanism for the dimethyl sulfone to dimethyl sulfate conversion. The bizarre incident surrounding the death of Gloria Ramirez will continue to remain a medical and chemical mystery. Thanks for listening. If you like the podcast, please tell someone about it. Recommend Weird Darkness to your friends, family, and co-workers who love the paranormal, horror stories, or true crime like you do. Every time you share the podcast with someone new, it helps spread the word about the show, and a growing audience makes it possible for me to keep doing the podcast. Plus, telling others about Weird Darkness also helps get the word out about resources that are available for those who suffer from depression, so please, share the podcast with someone today. Do you have a dark tale to tell of your own? Fact or fiction, click on Tell Your Story on the website and I might use it in a future episode. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. The Butcher Vampire was written by Morgan Dunn. The Mongolian Death Worm is by Natasha Ishik. The Pentelli Cave Enigma is by Caleb Strom, and The Toxic Woman was written by Kaushik Patowry. Weird Darkness Theme by Alibi Music Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. 1 John 4 verse 18 There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. And a final thought, good things come to those who wait, but better things come to those who work for it. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. And given to the medical school in Gottingen. Gottingen. Gotenchen, Gotenchen, Gotenen, in Gotenen, in Gotenen, to a medical school in Gotenen. Harman and Hans Grand's dri- Harman and Hans Grand's grisly crimes had one other tragic effect. Although homosexuality, Harman and Han, Harman and Hans Grand's, hello, who be here, ha. Harmon and Hans Grand's Grizzly Crimes. Okay, let's see if we can actually say that this time. Mackerley's expedition team tried different ways to project. Expedition team tried different ways to project to project to project vibrations, claiming to be from an unknown organization. Put up barbed. Put up barbed wire. Unknown organization. Put up. Bar, put up barbed.